I think a startup is all about finding the truth, right? You are trying to uh, solve a person's problem or people's problem and then trying to extract value from the market. And so there's also, there's all sorts of uh, gotchas. Did you talk to the right people? Did you build the right thing? Um, are you really satisfying that need? And that is a lot of experimentation and there's tons of pitfalls. So all the pitfalls that I had may not translate to uh, you know, other startups, but you know, um, raising cash, maintaining, um, your, making your uh, employees happy, uh, finding product market fit, all these sort of things are, I believe, vast majority of the problems or issues are sort of internal to the startup. Um, of course, there's competitive pressures that are external, but, you know, this is a really big topic. You know, building a company is very hard. Uh, solving people's problem uh, is very hard. Getting pro product market fit is very hard. It's a lot of experimentation. And uh, yes, everything is hard. So historically, uh, tech startups have one huge advantage, which is that they are faster and more nimble than the than bigger players, right? They can outcompete, they can find that niche, they can talk to customers and adapt faster. And I think um, what's a little bit different in this environment is that a lot of the bigger incumbents, they have access to the biggest models earlier. And so not only do they have distribution, but now they have speed. And I think that that is kind of unique to uh, today's environment. And so the advice I give to startups, and uh, this is something that we implement at uh, Aussie Labs, is that you know we don't treat um, AI capability, whether it's model or data or compute, as a um, strategic differentiator, right? Um, we we believe it's it's something that you can't easily capture value from. However, we're voracious users of AI, whether it's for code generation or agentic AI to accelerate our engineering. Um, you know, our engineering exper uh, experimentation, testability, all that stuff is massively accelerated with the, with the use of these tools. And so that's what I would recommend is don't build the AI, but use it voraciously. And um, the huge advantage that you get is you can do engineering a lot faster, which means you can explore deep tech. You can, um, you can solve really um, fundamental human problems like, you know, life expectancy, health, energy, um, uh, access to food, access to clean water, plastic, uh, you know, in the environment, all sorts of very hard technical problems. And I think those are, that's where a lot of the value and opportunity is. There's a lot of competition. There's simply a lot of competition. So I think small startups will have a very, very hard, close to impossible time to create the next generation AI hardware chip. They will have next to impossible time to create the frontier generative AI model. They will have uh, an impossible effort to create the largest data lake, right? And all three of those, that's, you know, there's one chip manufacturer that has the best chip. There is one company that has the frontier model. And there's another company that has the largest data lake in the world, right? And to, to compete with those companies is just not a good strategic move. Right, um, it would be great if there was competition in, in that area. Uh, that'd be interesting, um, but like the reality is, you know, um, AI is really accessible. You can get access to these models, whether it's open source or pr proprietary, relatively cheaply. And if you're trying to get to market and try to solve people's problems as quickly as possible, and to get to that truth as fast as possible. The, uh, the worst thing you can do is to go through a 10-year investment in uh, creating something that's 5% better in those, in those areas. Multi-tenancy is simply two tenants share, sharing the same resource. So you got a roommate, you're sharing a car, that's multi-tenancy. Uh, multi-tenancy exists in almost every resource in the data center, whether it's memory, storage, uh, CPUs, GPUs, um, uh, servers, data centers, all those things are relatively multi-tenant. Um, so multi-tenancy uh, drives uh, better economics for, for those uh, resources. So GPUs in particular are one of the most expensive parts of a data center. And so in my last company, Bitfusion, we, we invented the first software-defined uh, virtualization for GPUs, where you could, you could take this half a million dollar or a million dollar server and split it up into a thousand different pieces and have a thousand different users take advantage of that, of that hardware. That drove up utilization, that reduced cost for, for the user. So this is a very common cloud uh, feature uh, to, in today's data centers. 
So vertical in integration, you can kind of think about it in a couple of different ways. I think vertical integration solves the problem of getting a reliable technology stack that just works, right? And a lot of companies are doing that, and it's very important, uh, and I think it's valuable to the marketplace, right? Um, to get something that just works is quite, a, quite difficult. You need a lot of validators, a lot of certifiers, have a go through a lot of different workloads and, and test everything out. Um, so you can't possibly um, you know, test across every single application, or every single orchestrator, or every single kind of hardware platform. Um, you have to kind of focus. Um, so I think vertical integration by itself is useful. The way to think about, um, you know, from a competitive point of view, is that the top of the stack and the bottom of the stack is where all the proprietary uh, bits are. So hardware is proprietary. Drivers above the uh, hardware are typically proprietary. Runtimes are open source, closed source. Then the frameworks, the orchestrators, and a lot of the services are actually open source in the middle. And then the top, uh, the actual application could be proprietary or open source. So the middle of the stack is very open. And um, you know the ability of a small company to select and use an NVIDIA GPU versus an AMD GPU or an Intel GPU or any other accelerator is quite easy, simply because you can run your framework, your application, very easily on a different, on a different platform. Um, and that's all the work of the open source community, right? of creating those, those linkages where you can automatically detect what device, you don't have to change your model, you don't have to change your application. Um, so I think what most vendors have figured out is you can kind of vertical, vertically integrate up to a certain point, and then um, that provides enough choice for, for, the, uh, you know, for the industry. I think there's a lot of innovation at every point in the stack. So the stack that I described, application level all the way to the, uh, the hardware. There's already a lot of innovation. There's a lot of competition there. There's a lot of excitement. Now, um, I think there's probably two things to watch out for, which is that whenever um, a larger company has a substantial AI component, whether it's the best hardware or the best model or the best data set, that choosing one of those could mean that you're forced into a decision in a different part of the stack. For example, um, if you were to choose, I want to use OpenAI's best model, the only place that you can you can create a HIPAA compliant or a SOC 2 compliant application is actually on Azure using that model. So making a decision on a model now forces you to use a particular cloud solution. Um, most of uh, data center revenues for uh, the largest chip manufacturers go to these hyperscalers. And so there's this real big possibility of bundling and tie-in where choosing one ingredient will force you to use um, another. Another example is uh, Google, for example, has the, the most massive data set, uh, data set uh, with YouTube, for example. Uh, if they choose to say, hey, the only way to train your model on YouTube is to use our platform, then you're locked into their, their stack. So I think that's something to watch out for. But by and large, if you, if you stick to open source, if you stick to um, you know, the standard uh, technology stack, you do have a lot of choice. But if you are looking for the latest and greatest in the frontier uh, hardware model or data set, that's when I think there's a possibility of getting some lock-in tie-in that someone could look for. Another thing I would mention is that, um, you know, if we believe, you know, as a so society that intelligence is a very important thing for society to, to, uh, uh, to invest in, and all of our competitors or all of our, you know, all the other countries are investing in this technology, um, I think there's a way that uh, maybe the government should also invest in in uh, smaller players, and you can do that not necessarily with grants, but you, but perhaps for um, for contracts for bidding, uh, maybe you could prefer the smaller players rather than the bigger ones, the smaller open source ones. I think that's a good way, a kind of good positive way, without regulation, to to foster innovation.